All right. Thank you. Good morning uh, to the Senate uh, um, or the combined Senate Committee on Finance, and Ways and Means on Public Subcommittee on Public Safety, Natural Resources, and Transportation. Um, today we've got very um, various uh, budgets here and on public safety and wildlife. And uh, so we uh, welcome you. Um, first, why don't we do the um, the roll, the secretary to call the roll. Assemblywoman Miller. Assemblywoman Monroe Marino. Here. Assemblywoman Peters. Here. Assemblywoman Titus. Assemblywoman Tolls. Here. Assemblyman Watts. Here. Senator Brooks. Here. Senator Guaguchia. Here. Chair Dennis. Here, thank you. Okay, um, so we are going to, um, I don't have my notes in front of me, but the uh, um, just we welcome everybody and uh, know that uh, you'll have an opportunity to give uh, public comment, which will be at the end. And we limit, we limit public comment to two minutes each. And um, if you wish to give uh, comment, there's, well, there's a couple ways to see the, uh, the, the meeting is through either um, through Nellis on the web, on our website um, or through the YouTube channel and to make sure you go in and register um, as you go in um, it'll allow you to register so that you could give comments so with that I think we're going to go ahead and just begin and go to uh, our first uh, budget which is uh, Nevada Highway Patrol so if they'll uh, Good morning, Chair Dennis. This is Sherry Brigaman. I'm the Deputy Director for the Department of Public Safety. And Director Togliati wanted me to let you know that he would have uh, loved to have been here, but he is in Washington, D.C. at an FBI National Leadership Conference. Um, so I will be introducing our Highway Patrol facilitators and managers for this budget. And the first one is Colonel Ann Carpenter, and she will be assisted by Major James Simpson and Captain Malesko and their fiscal manager, Christy Defer. Chair? Yeah. Uh, I would like to per request permission to share our screen. Yes, go ahead. Can you see that? I can. Okay. Uh, good morning, Chair. I am Colonel Ann Carpenter with the Department of Public Safety, and I am the Chief of the Nevada Highway Patrol. I would also like to introduce Major James Simpson. Captain Martin Malesko and Christy Defer, who will be presenting with me today. Additionally, Deputy Director Sherry Brigman is here with us and will be available for questions. It is my pleasure to be here to provide an overview of the Nevada Highway Patrol to the Senate Committee on Finance, Assembly Committee on Ways and Means, and Joint Subcommittees on Public Safety. Thank you again for inviting us. Chair, with your permission, after we present Highway Patrol Budget Account 4713, we would like to present one slide that contains an enhancement for budget account 4705, our department canine program. 
Budget account 4705 is forfeiture funded and only provides support for our canine program. Chair, would that be okay? Um, yeah, I think we'll be okay with that. I know we have some questions on that, so that's fine. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, for your convenience, we have added a page number to the bottom left-hand corner of each slide, which should help us if, if any questions should arise. Chapter 480 of the Nevada Revised Statute provides for the creation of the Department of Public Safety and under its authority provides for the creation of several divisions, including the Nevada Highway Patrol. This chapter also provides for the creation of the Nevada Highway Patrol Division, its composition, powers and duties of its chief, contracting authority for control of vehicular traffic in connection with special events, and duties of personnel. The Nevada Highway Patrol is comprised of 596 employees throughout 30 different job classifications located in all 17 counties statewide, over three main budgetary accounts. These dedicated men and women are aimed at protecting Nevada, the Silver State, its citizens and visitors. The Department of Public Safety and Nevada Highway Patrol enforces the Nevada, excuse me, enforces the traffic laws of the state, investigates traffic crashes, assists motorists, and enforces and regulates commercial vehicles, transporting cargo and hazardous materials. We are committed to being the state's trusted law enforcement leader focused on public safety through traffic enforcement, education and engagement. We are the roadway to a safer Nevada and we stand together to serve and protect. Through our noble cause, we honor our history with great pride and commitment. We are the Nevada Highway Patrol. The Nevada Highway Patrol has three budget accounts supporting 596 full-time equivalent positions. Budget account 4713 is the Nevada Highway Patrol's primary budget account and is highway funded. Budget account 4721 provides grant funding for commercial vehicle enforcement. Budget account 4705 provides support for the department's canine program. The Nevada Highway Patrol's core activities include traffic operations, commercial enforcement operations, and administrative support services. Our special operations include fatal or high profile investigations, criminal interdiction, and task forces. These officers work alongside state, local, and federal partners, all which contribute to our overall objectives. The Highway Patrol has also taken a proactive leadership approach in educating the public through the use of social media platforms and messaging campaigns with our various partners. We are also committed to increasing public awareness on our big five focus areas, which will be covered in upcoming slides. The Nevada Highway Patrol has four primary goals. These goals include, one, investing in our people by focusing on employee health and wellness, identifying future leaders through succession planning and retaining our current workforce. Two, mitigating loss of life, injuries, and property damage by reevaluating current resource allocation, improving data collection and transparency, and identifying best practices. Three, enhancing public trust by improving availability of services, education and awareness, and accountability to the public. Four, improving divisional efficiencies by using the requested budget enhancements to provide our employees with the required tools to do their jobs and more efficiently utilize available resources. I will now turn the presentation over to Major James Simpson. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair. I'm Major James Simpson with the Department of Public Safety, and I'm a Deputy Chief with the Nevada Highway Patrol. Over the years, we have listened, we have learned, and we have modified our efforts to focus on three critical emphasis areas that directly impact traffic safety. These have been, ah, these have been branded as the three E's, education, enforcement and engineering. Here are a few of the programs we'd like to highlight. Below 100, this educational campaign focuses on law enforcement officer safety to help reduce the number of law enforcement related deaths to below 100 per year, a number that has not been reached since 1943. Drive. This driver safety course designed by the Nevada Highway Patrol was created to help young drivers understand the dangers of driving. Through educational videos, pictures, and real life stories, troopers help teens to develop a new perspective of roadway safety. 
Driver's Edge. This is a free half-day program that teaches real-life emergency avoidance and overall driver safety. Driver's Edge is aimed at anyone 21 years old or younger getting their license or permit. And Advanced Roadside Impaired Driving Enforcement, also known as A-RIDE. This course trains law enforcement officers to observe, identify, and articulate the signs of impaired driving related to drugs, alcohol, or combination of both in order to reduce the number of impaired drivers and impaired driving-related traffic collisions. Our second E focuses on enforcement. Motor, motor vehicle crashes are one of the leading causes of death in the United States. Many may automatically assume that enforcement is centered on writing citations or even making arrests when necessary. Though whether a citation is written, a written warning, a verbal warning, or simply by being visible, enforcement or education is vital to modifying driver or pedestrian behavior. Examples of some of these educational and enforcement programs include joining forces and badge on board. Joining forces is a multi-jurisdictional law enforcement program that promotes statewide enforcement in the areas of impaired or distracted driving, pedestrian safety, speeding, and seatbelt use. The badge on board program is a high visibility media campaign and enforcement program designed to educate motorists on how to share the road safely with commercial motor vehicles. And the big five, what is it? The big five are the five most dangerous collision causing behaviors that are most likely to result in death or serious bodily injury. The big five include impaired driving, hazardous driving, speeding, distracted driving, and unrestrained occupants. These are the five root causes to the problem of fatal and serious bodily injury crashes that claim far too many lives every year, which leaves behind a path of destruction. The ripple effect that these crashes have on the families, friends, first responders, and our higher patrol families is unmeasurable. While vehicle technology and roadway infrastructure have improved, it is not a replacement for driver behavior and poor decision making that ultimately contributes to negatively affecting the big five. Together with our stakeholders and partners, we will work to identify new and innovative methods to educate our communities on our mission, programs, and how we can improve compliance and the top primary collision factors in Nevada. The Nevada Highway Patrol is a key partner in planning and implementation of the Nevada Highway Safety Plan. The Highway Patrol encourages and supports innovation to develop new and effective ways of keeping roadways safe, lessening the chance of another tragic incident. Through road safety audits, the Highway Patrol is better able to offer countermeasures and perspective to roadway safety engineers and developers to improve and build upon existing roadways. Education, enforcement, and engineering. When more people know about them, share them and live by them, more lives will be saved. That is our bottom line. And in traffic operations, our primary enforcement measurement is the mileage death rate, also known as the MDR. The mileage death rate compares fat fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. This measurement is a national standard to measure highway safety set by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, also known as NHTSA. The chart above shows comparative fatality rates for the nation, Nevada, and in our jurisdiction. Nevada's mileage death rate decreased from 1.26 in 2015 to 1.06 in 2019. The Nevada Highway Patrol mileage death rate decreased from 0.59 to 0.52 during that same time period. While mileage death rate predictions for 2020 are expected to increase, annual miles traveled are said to have decreased. This based on unofficial Department of Transportation projections, vehicle miles traveled have decreased up to 25% while fatalities have increased. Though official numbers will not be available until December of 2021. Nevada's commercial crashes are a as a percent of total crashes is low and has remained very consistent. 
When taken into consideration, fatal crashes involving large trucks and how Nevada compares nationally, according to the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, Nevada was the third lowest in 2018, but large trucks still pose a huge problem. While crashes involving commercial motor vehicles are relatively low, these crashes do tend to be more severe by interrupting normal traffic flow and interfering with interstate commerce. This is more prevalent in rural areas where there are no alternative routes if a motor vehicle accident were to take place. When these fatalities occur, this causes roadways to remain shut down for up to eight hours or more. Nationally, in 2018, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration reported that large truck crashes result in carnage to motorists. Our troopers drive on average 24,000 miles per year. Therefore, safety starts with us. Reliable, efficient, and effective police service fleets are the foundation for a well-operated and self community, safe community. Our proven approach and professional technicians keep these units running at optimum efficiency. Our stringent preventative maintenance and fleet management programs are designed for these challenges. Our communities should expect a safe, reliable, and available fleet for everyday use. In 2015, the Highway Patrol implemented a new performance measure to track on-time vehicle maintenance relative to the manufacturer's maintenance schedule. We continuously exceeded our goal of 85% since 2015. I will now turn the presentation over to our Administrative Services Officer, Christy Defer. Good morning, Chair. I am Christy Defer with the Department of Public Safety, and I am the Administrative Services Officer with the Nevada Highway Patrol. I will be presenting the enhancements for budget accounts 4713 and 4705. After 4713, we will pause to allow the committee to ask any questions, and then we will move on to 4705 before wrapping up our presentation. Budget account 4713, E225, request to move uniform allowances from NHP's personnel category to the uniform category to support agency uniform replacement. E805 requests the reclassification of a DPS officer two position to a DPS major to be responsible for headquarters to oversee all administrative services and functions statewide. E901 funds the transfer of one management analyst position to the Nevada Highway Patrol from the Office of Traffic Safety for oversight of the ignition interlock program. E226 funds a temporary contracted position to assist with our fleet unit in Reno. By utilizing a temporary contracted position part-time, it will be a cost savings to the division versus creating a permanent full-time position. Savings is also realized with quick repair and service turnaround. E910 requests the transfer of eight DPS Officer 2 positions to the Nevada Highway Patrol from the DPS Training Division. E350 funds the purchase of 70 oral fluid mobile analyzer systems for roadside impaired driver testing. E357 funds the purchase of equipment for the Highway Patrol Multidisciplinary Investigation and Reconstructive Teams, also known as MERT. E712 funds the replacements of 130 desktop computers and 10 laptop computers. E713 funds the replacement of 422 mobile data computers or MDCs. These are in, uh, fleet related enhancements on this slide. E710 requests funds for the replacement of fleet vehicles which have exceeded the mileage threshold, including 140 police interceptor utility vehicles and 19 pickups totaling 159 vehicles. 
E711 requests request funds for the replacement of seven police motorcycles exceeding their mileage threshold. E714 requests funding for the replacement of 163 mobile citation printers. And Chair, that concludes our enhancements for budget account 4713. Before we move on to budget account 4705, our canine program, we would like to take a brief pause to allow the committee to ask any questions. Okay, well, we're going, we do have some questions here. So we're gonna start with um, Senator Brooks. Got a few questions. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question's regarding E805 um, and uh, new major position. And just uh, curious, uh, how would the the recommended um, new major position relieve the current majors from performing their administrative oversight and their commands? I believe the colonel um, has some information on that, so I will defer to her. Yes, hello, Ann Carpenter. For the record, um, can you can you say your question one more time so I can ensure I answer it? Sure, sure. I'm just uh, want to know how the new the new major position that's being uh, proposed, how that would relieve the administrative duties that the current majors and their their commands are, are currently doing. Yes, sir. And and Carpenter for the record, and thank you for your question. Um, the headquarters major, if we would have that, is one of the most important positions that we need. Uh, the major would oversee legislative functions, union issues, grievances, personnel issues. And although they may have a smaller span of control um, in it, the operational majors have quite a large amount of people to oversee. However, it's important to remember that this, this HQ major would be supervising not only staff, but they would be uh, overseeing all of those administrative functions throughout the state. So let's let's talk about fleet. Um, it, with, our, with our fleet, they would be making sure that um, uh, the deployment of resources and deployment of equipment would, would be on schedule. They would be looking at any kind of um, uh, internal affairs, making sure uh, deadlines are, are met. Uh, so does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. I think that yeah, you know, just wanted a description of, of what they would be doing and, and how that frees up the current majors that are in those three positions right now, how that, are free, how that frees them or how that frees them up to do their job. Right. Ann Carpenter, for the record, the, this, this new position would have oversight over the entire state. So uh, with the, head, with, with the oper operational majors that are in the north and the south, they would be doing 24 out 24 seven uh, uh, oversight of their commands where the headquarters major would be overseeing the entire state with all administrative functions. So there would be administrative functions within each command, but the point of contact or the hub would be headquarters, if that makes sense. That does, thank you, I appreciate that. And then I have a follow-up question on how was this position uh, for reclassification to, to achieve this position how was this selected um, uh, as as an as a, a, in, um, an alternative to another reclassification or another classification? Excuse me, uh, to do this job. How did we land on major to do this job as opposed to maybe another classification? Dan Carpenter, for the record, we we already have a lieutenant and captain in headquarters, and we we think that the major position needs to be classified as the major because of the rank structure. We would need another uh, counterpart to the operational majors in the North and the South, especially when it comes to legislative uh, issues and union issues. All right, that makes sense to me. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have other questions here? I don't see any hands up. So, okay, so we're, we'll go on. Um, uh, oh, one thing before I forget, can you make sure we mark everybody here? Um, I know some of the Miller was here, 
when we did the roll, but she was at the tail end and we, I think we missed her and I think uh, CS uh, Assemblywoman Titus also. So everybody's here. So it's just for the record, make sure that we mark that. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Any other questions on this one? Okay, so let's go on. If we have no further ones on this particular budget, um, you can go on to your next budget. Oh, wait, I see uh, Senator Gokachia. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and I'll be really brief. Uh, I know we're going to take it up in another budget, but uh, the oral fluid uh, mobile analyzers, I'm very interested in what those look like. And uh, again, I'll wait for the next budget, but just wanted to know, let you know I'm really interested in how those are going to work. No question. I just uh, just a comment. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Sure. All right. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. We just need to advance one slide, please. Thank you. Again, Christy Defer for the record. So this is budget account forty seven oh five. E350 request funding to expand the canine program. And that would be the funding, the expansion of the canine program to 11 canines total. Before we move on, we would like to take another brief pause to allow the committee to ask any questions about 4705. Okay. Yes. Um, I know we have, uh, let's see. From the woman Peters. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a couple of questions for you regarding the budget. My first question is: Would the addition of drug detection canines provide the NHP with enough canine coverage to effectively conduct a drug seizure test per traffic stop within the time allowable pursuant by the Supreme Court decision Rodriguez versus the United States? Lieutenant Colonel Conmay, are you on? Would you be able to answer that question? Yes. Um, if I understand the question, um, are you asking, would we use the dogs on every stop? And, and then the second part, would we be able to do that within the time frame? Um, I don't think the intent is to uh, run the dogs on every traffic stop. In fact, we would be looking to uh, use dogs when we had reasonable suspicion to think that perhaps there was some criminal activity going on. So we don't want to misunderstand that we intend to run dogs on every stop. And maybe I didn't understand the question. Um, the question was more related to, um, to the time it takes per stop if a canine unit is used. Um, and ensuring that we're meeting those time limits that were set in the Re Rodriguez versus United States for Supreme Court decision. Yes, and the time limits are not extended. In fact, um, you can't even use the dog as an excuse to extend that limit out to the hour. In other words, if, you, if the dog is there or the dog can get there during the time that you're conducting routine business involved with that stop, then you might, if you have reasonable suspicion, you might use that dog to determine whether or not criminal activity is going on. But you're not going to use the dog as an excuse to extend that stop even to the one hour limit. You need to do that within the time that it reasonably takes to conduct the business of the stop that makes sense. Absolutely. My question is related to adding the additional dogs, drug dogs, um, do drug detective detection canines. Would that increase your ability to meet those time frames per those stops in which you would like to mobilize them? It would certainly um, enable us to have more resources, maybe closer to particular stops, and, and it might help with that. Um, I think the, the obviously we do not want to uh, overstep or violate any rights with respect to those stops. I don't think we're asking for the dogs 
exclusively for that purpose. We want to be able to cover wider areas. Um, but in any event, uh, the intent is not to impede or to infringe on uh, the time limits. Absolutely, that makes sense. Um, I would be curious if you guys do data collection to see how the um, these additional canine units would um, impact those timelines. My second question is, how did the agency determine that five additional canines are needed in the recommendation? And what benefits are expected in the drug bomb and arson detection efforts? So we want to be realistic in our in our approach to this. So it takes time to train and develop uh, canines, train and develop handlers. Uh, and so we felt that that number was realistic over the span of the biennium to bring that number in and get them uh, functional over that time period. Uh, and then I'm sorry, I forgot the second half of the question. Um, the second half was what benefits are expected in the drug bomb and arson detection efforts with those additional five canine units. With respect to narcotics enforcement, we just uh, intend for that to improve our ability to interdict uh, narcotics uh, transportation on the highway. So we expect that that would improve our ability to do that. With respect to explosive and, and uh, arson dogs, we've seen in this past year especially that we have we're, we're confronted with events now where it's just going to be safer to be able to screen locations and events especially state facilities for problems um, we have one dog that can do that now statewide we feel an additional dog uh, will improve our ability to do that when especially when we know there are events planned uh, and so we expect that will improve safety and security, especially around state facilities. And then, of course, our resources would be available to help other partners uh, upon request. With arson dogs, we expect that to improve our ability. And, and I know the fire marshal's on and he can speak to it as well. But generally, we expect that to improve our capability in identifying whether accelerants are used and we can reduce some investigative time both at scene and in labs if we can narrow down through the use of a dog where we're looking for signs of an accelerant and maybe submitting fewer samples for testing because we're more certain about what it is we're submitting because of the dog's work there, if that makes sense. I think it does, absolutely. Um, and thank you for the responses to those questions. Um, now, in my notes, uh, it's my understanding that you uh, believe you can get these <clears throat> additional um, canines donated through third par party private entity. Um, and, and can you just confirm that that is how you would um, be able to access these dogs? That is our plan. So we have several sources that um, provide that service. And the plan is to seek out canines from those sources. And then this enhancement is intended to be able to support those uh, once we bring them on. Thank you very much. All right, I see uh, Senator Gokachi, I believe you had your hand up. Thank you. Uh, and, and I'm just kind of wondering, especially the, the drug canines, are there gonna be any of those placed in rural Nevada Clearly, you know, we've got the 93-95 drug pipeline that's running through the eastern, central, and eastern side of the state. Uh, are you going to place some of these canines in rural Nevada? Yes. Yeah, so part of the reason for the expansion is to be able to um, uh, place these canines in locations and expand our abilities in those locations. And, of course, as we do interdiction and other things, we also do plan those and target um, what might be problem areas, if that makes sense. But yes, we intend to expand that way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Anyone else? I don't see any hands raised. Mr. Oh, yes. Chair? Yes, Senator, or Assemblywoman Titus. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, I, I'm curious about the duplication of services, and I know that there are other agencies out there that have canine units. I'm supportive of the canine units, but I know even in, in Lyon County, we have a canine unit and throughout. Do you, do you, you ever call those uh, units in to assist with some of, some of your needs? Um, it's hard to cover this big state of ours, and I'm just wondering about the, the duplication of services uh, and, and how often do you use a, a like cooperative agreement if you do have one? I'm not sure that we have formal cooperative agreements, but yes, we do. Everybody helps everybody else. And if there's a need, um, folks make requests and, and we support each other in that way. Keep in mind that um, canines, like everything else, they have uh, their abilities and they have their needs as far as overuse as well, right? So I don't think we see a lot of duplication of efforts. There are different agencies across the state that do have canines. And they do focus on their individual problem areas or needs. Um, we have lots of highways and lots of ground to cover. And we feel like these additional canines will help us do that. Uh, and working in conjunction with others as well. Great, thank you for that. Because I was hoping that would be your answer because I, five, even the additional five dogs clearly won't be enough to cover the state at all times everybody needs a rest including animals um and so i'm glad to hear you do have that uh, ongoing thank you thank you mr chair thank you okay um anybody else I don't, looking for any additional hands i don't see any i think that's all the questions that we have on this particular budget so we are ready for you to move on to the next one Okay, and I will now turn the presentation over to Captain Martin Malesko in Las Vegas. Good afternoon, Chair. I am Captain Martin Malesko with the Nevada Department of Public Safety, Highway Patrol Division. There are many challenges that are impacting our ability to focus on the big five, let alone education, enforcement, and engineering. More specifically, keeping Nevada roadways safe. As demands increase year after year, our vacancy rate continues to worsen. These vacancies contribute to reduced service levels, increased response times, and decreased visibility. While we are committed to making Nevada stronger, these vacancies coupled with projected separations will only intensify these challenges, making it more difficult to meet our performance measures. Currently, there are 85 vacancies statewide. Moreover, 132 are eligible to retire by 2025. An additional 222 employees through 2030 and another 518 employees by 2035. This is nearly an 87% turnover from retirements alone. These figures do not include those employees who have or are planning on purchasing service credit. Therefore, more employees are eligible, eligible to retire sooner further accelerating our employee turnover and service reduction for the citizens of the state. The financial impact of separations aside, the state pays for the training, the wages, and the benefits only for these newly trained law enforcement officers to leave and go to other law enforcement agencies for better pay and benefits. More so, because of the high Nevada purse contribution rates that state employees must pay, Training cadets from the academy through field training can certainly cost the state sixty to one hundred thousand dollars per cadet. These early separations are costing the state upwards near two point two million dollars per year, with little to no return on our investment. Between year zero and year two alone, our turnover rate exceeds eighty-five percent. Our team has prepared a number of reports that we can provide to the chair and joint committee if interested. Not all police agencies experience the same challenges with recruiting and retaining officers. Some agencies reported struggling with recruitment, but not retention. Other agencies had the opposite experience, facing a greater challenge with holding on to new officers for more than a few years. Since 2016, there have been 392 employee separations. The most common reason for leaving is for better pay, 
compensation, which leaves, I'm sorry, for better compensation, which includes leaving for better pay, insurance, and benefits. Based on our analysis, 51% of first year troopers are leaving to another agency for better pay. In an effort to be solution driven, we want to briefly cover some solutions to combat these challenges based on self reported exit interviews. There are some solutions and strategies that can not only help recruit but retain personnel while focusing on community safety and protecting Nevada's infrastructure. Some of these improved benefits may include longevity pay, flexible retirement options, professional development, college degree incentive pay, merit increases, and rural duty station incentives. The stressors of policing can take a significant toll on the physical and mental health of officers. By giving officers resources to help them build their resiliency, agencies may retain officers who otherwise might leave. Some agencies provide incentives for passing an annual physical fitness exam, paid gym memberships, regularly paid visits to the psychologist, and a mandatory visit within five days of a critical incident. If the crisis went no farther than the need to attract more applicants, there might be a relatively simple, albeit expensive solution. Just increase officers' pay and benefits to the point where the supply of new recruits meets the demands. But there's a deeper, more important shift occurring that complicates the situation. Today, police agencies must hire officers with a much wider array of skills, talents, knowledge, and experience than was required in the past. The old ways of recruiting and hiring are being replaced by innovative, streamlined approaches. Although compensation is important, money alone is no longer a strong enough motivator. Young people want a higher quality of life to match the job. And the job itself is changing. Being a crime fighter is still important, but it's not enough. We need cadets who see the importance of their new role as guardians confronting the social ills of drug addiction, mental illness, and homelessness. So we need to redouble our efforts and find new ways to encourage cadets with the right stuff and hold on to those that we have. We would be remiss if we did not talk about community partnerships and how vital they are and have been to our innovation, creativity, and overall success. Community partners are essential to widespread change and we could not be here without them today. Because of them and your legislative assistance, the Highway Patrol would like to thank its many community partners. And today in particular, we would like to highlight one partnership, the Nevada Donor Network. December 2020 marked the fifth anniversary of the Department of Public Safety's statewide partnership with the Nevada Donor Network. Together, we have shared this remarkable opportunity to make life-changing positive impacts through organ, eye, and tissue donation on behalf of heroic donors their generous families, and those who wait for these much needed gifts. Since the beginning of our partnership in December of 2015, the department has made 321 referrals to the Nevada Donor Network. Through our efforts alone, the department has helped thousands from the waiting list with tissue transplants and 58 others with the gift of sight. Moreover, several divisions throughout our department have joined forces with the Nevada Donor Network to sponsor individual donor registration and community service events resulting in over 4,000 donor registrations statewide. This innovative model partnership has not only been recognized statewide, but also nationally for our significant contributions and the impact it has on organ, eye, and tissue donation. The Department of Public Safety remains fully committed to supporting these many partnerships. And as such, we are working on a new partnership opportunity with Dr. Bill Souza from UNLV, the Center for Crime and Justice Policy, to develop new solutions to ensure we remain progressive despite these challenges. Before I turn the presentation back over to Colonel Carpenter, I want to share this photo with each of you. This is not just any ordinary photo. These five Nevada State Troopers are standing in front of the ghost bike, which is in memorial of the five cyclists that were taken from us too soon on Thursday, December 10th, 2020. From left to right, Trooper Adam Welch. Adam is the primary investigator in this horrific crash that is working with his team to map out the unfortunate events. Trooper Jeff Freeman. Jeff was responsible for the commercial motor vehicle inspection of the heavy machinery that just claimed five lives. Sergeant Jeremy George. 
Jeremy was one of the first responders and supervisors on scene that had to navigate the chaos while trying to manage resources and response efforts. Trooper Ashley Wellman. Ashley represents the leadership and fortitude that our division represents in times of tragedy and need. Trooper Travis Smacka. Travis is our public education officer that not only responded, but had to try to make sense of this unimaginable, all the while being re-victimized countless times over and over as he provided interviews to news outlets. You see, we did not want to leave you with just another data point, another line item, and another mission statement. We wanted to leave you with a sentiment that I know is shared by everyone who puts on the badge every single day in our department and each of you today. In my nearly 16 years, I've had the privilege of working for this department. We have lost over 5,032 lives on the roadways across our state. That's 5,032 and that number continues to grow. Since this number was captured just over a few weeks ago, an additional 20 lives have been taken from us, including, including one of our very own. Trooper Derek Otero lost his 26 year old wife, Coral, mother of two, in a tragic crash early Saturday morning. We cannot allow ourselves to see this number as just another set of data points. These were lives that were lost and families that were forever broken. And we owe it to them to have a sense of urgency in our tone when discussing our mission and potential as lives are on the line. The potential and the greatness of these lives lost are simply unknown. The loss of life that we witness as state troopers stays with us well beyond the end of our careers. Your troopers, your fatal team investigators, commercial troopers, your public information officers, and your command staff members all understand what it is like to be there when someone takes their last breath or to console a grieving parent, family member, and friend. We remember, we reflect, and we understand. We also know that we can do better but to do more, to be more effective, we need resources. Much like you have seen in our presentation today. Like those five pictured above would also say, hesitantly, we can try, but we simply are not enough. It's just not us who suffer, but all Nevadans. We are purpose-driven, but people-powered, and we need your help to move forward. To the Senate Committee on Finance, Assembly Committee on Ways and Means, and Joint Subcommittees on Public Safety, we thank you for your time, your energy, and your support. Chair, on this slide, you will find my contact information. Should the committee need anything at all, please do not hesitate to contact me. I would like to open up to any other questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any additional questions? Chair, if I may. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for that presentation and for everything you do. I know that this is an extremely um, challenging job and the things that you see and what you face are things that most of us can't imagine. And we just appreciate you going out there every day to keep our, um, our citizens safe. And thanks for sharing. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, with that, I think we're done with um, those budgets. And now we're ready to go on to the uh, DPS Central Repository for Nevada Records of Criminal History. And Good morning, Dennis. Um, sorry, Chair Dennis. This is Sherry Brighaman again, Deputy Director for the Department of Public Safety. I'd like to introduce Mindy McKay, Administrator for the Records Communication um, and Compliance Division, RCCD, and her Fiscal Manager, Lisa Galloway. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chair and members of the Joint Committees. I'm Mindy McKay, Division Administrator with the Department of Public Safety, Records, Communications, and Compliance Division. I have with me today some of my amazing team members. As the Deputy Director mentioned, Lisa Galloway is our Chief Financial Officer. I also have with me Erica Suzy Yamas, who is the Records Bureau Chief, 
Julie Ornelas, who is the NCGIS Modernization Program Administrator, and Bob Kalin, the NCGIS Program Senior Advisor from MTG Consulting to help answer any questions I may not be able to. And at this time, I would like to share my screen. Go ahead. Is that showing up for you? E yes, it is. Well, although we are seeing your, your notes on the side, so you might want to make it full screen. How is that? There you go. Wonderful. We appreciate the opportunity to present our budget today. I will present budget 4709 first, stop for questions, then finish out with 4702. And with that, I'll get started. Our mission is provide complete, timely, and accurate criminal justice information while balancing the need for public safety and individuals' rights to privacy. On slide three, this is the slide that depicts the division's current organizational structure. The Records Bureau is currently staffed with 137 full-time equivalent positions and the Communications Bureau with 63 full-time equivalent positions. There are also 35 contracted staff. This slide doesn't look much different, but you'll see some boxes with red. This is the slide that depicts the division's proposed organizational structure with the added positions we are requesting. Our division is made up of 200 full-time equivalent positions and 35 contracted staff. We have six locations throughout the state. We have three budget accounts and approximately 20 disparate programs. We are funded with general fund, cost allocation, court assessments, fees, and federal grants. We will review two of our three budget accounts today, 4709 and 4702. We will go into more detail about the Records Bureau and the Communications Bureau shortly. The fiscal unit manages our accounts payable, accounts receivable, budget, contracts, building tasks, and they staff the reception desk at one of our locations. The Information Security and Compliance Unit ensures our department is compliant with state security policies and laws and ensures the state is compliant with federal security policies and laws through training, audit, and site security checks, among other important tasks. On slide six, budget account 4709, our Records Bureau has 14 disparate programs that it manages listed on the slide for you. There are multiple federal and state laws that govern the many programs in the division, which is a large list that I'm happy to provide upon request. As you can imagine, every legislative session has a large number of bills that impact the division. I'll review legislative impact shortly. And I also have some, some statistics that I will provide on the following slides. It is important to note that while some programs are fee-based, others have come to us as requirements that are underfunded by court assessments or simply unfunded and are maintained by the utilization of reserves. We also utilize reserves to cover any funding shortfalls with dwindling court assessments, which have historically been inadequate. The division receives general fund for our sexual assault forensic evidence kit tracking and reporting program. Some statistics here on this slide for you, I won't go over all of them, but I do wanna point out those that are hot topic programs. The third bullet down is civil fingerprints received. In 2019, we received over 261,000 civil fingerprints. In 2020, we received just over 221,000. In the state of Nevada, we have over 2,000 civil applicant accounts that submit those fingerprints. On this slide, I want to point out our sex offender registry. We currently have over 7,300 active registered sex offenders. We also have over 22,000 inactive sex offenders. We also gave you some um, statistics there for you on the tier levels of the sex offenders if you're interested. And lastly on this slide, I wanna point out our Brady Point of Contact Firearms Program who conducts the FBI NICS background checks. In 2019, we conducted over 102,000 NICS background checks. In 2020, we conducted over 185,000. That is an 80 plus percent increase. We are staffed in the Brady unit seven days a week and most holidays working five different shifts. We have two supervisors, currently both are new and in training. We have four lead positions who conduct all of the research. 
We have 11 frontline positions to process the initial background checks among other program tasks, with some of those being vacant and some of those being new hires. We are never fully staffed in Brady. We always have new staff in training, taking away tenured staff from program tasks. Now on to the legislative session impacts on the records communications and compliance division. Every legislative session, we start out tracking approximately 400 plus bills. And at the end of the session, we end up with approximately 100 bills, give or take a few that are enacted that impact the division on the topics provided on the slide. Being able to work with the sponsors, LCB legal and impacted entities is helpful for many reasons. So I greatly appreciate those partnerships. If we can better understand the purpose of the legislation from the sponsor's point of view, then we can better advise on the best way to ensure it's implementable as it relates to our division programs being impacted. Regarding the budget side of session, we are grateful for what is in this biennium's governor's recommended budget, specifically the full appropriation for our system modernization. I want to take this opportunity to remind everyone that we will require additional general funds for the next few biennia to continue the modernization implementation effort and then the maintenance and enhancements that is critical to officer and public safety. On a, as a side note, the division has two bills of their own this session, SB 19 and SB 31, which I'm happy to answer any questions on, but for now I can move on to the next slide. In Records Bureau, um, which is commonly referred to as the Criminal History Repository Budget Account 4709, we have E225, adding a program officer one will redirect the tasks of training staff and the CCW project away from the current supervisors and allow them to focus on tracking law and legislative changes, personnel and program matters. While this position is not, not meant to assist directly full-time with the phone volume in the Brady unit or any other program tasks, once the incumbent is trained, they can help out where needed, as long as it doesn't negatively impact their primary duties. In E227, we are adding two criminal, in the criminal history records unit, we are adding two administrative assistant two positions. These two positions are to assist keeping the workloads current. The criminal records unit performs disposition data entry, fingerprint card maintenance, assists courts with protection order data entry, record maintenance, scanning of records, sealing of criminal history records, et cetera. While the Insegis modernization program will help automate some of our processes and reduce some workload, it won't eliminate all manual tasks. Keep in mind also that implementation and establishing connections doesn't happen overnight, so it will take time to automate through interfaces. Another task to keep in mind is cleanup of information is always a necessary evil with system replacements that include data migration. Having full-time permanent state positions allows us to attract and retain applicants, reducing turnover and allowing us the opportunity to conduct a more comprehensive pre-employment background investigation, which we cannot do with contract attempts. Reducing the turnover creates efficiency in the unit by recruiting um, and training time. In E228, with the division's growth, this is to add a management analyst three, with the division's growth in programs, personnel, and locations over the years, the size and class specification of the fiscal unit has remained the same and is incongruent with the responsibilities and oversight it has gained. The division does not have an adequate succession plan or backup for the division's administrative services officer three and assuming responsibilities as chief financial officer of the division. Lastly, E33, E355, excuse me, is DPS's, we are DPS's biggest IT customer with Enterprise IT Services. Because we house the records repository, our IT needs continue to grow exponentially as our number of records grows. We are requesting additional program hours to help cover the division's changing programs and IT needs that includes ensuring our systems stay current and compliant with security requirements. On slide 11 is GO2. GO2 is requesting additional one-shot funding for the ongoing and CGIS modernization program effort. The funding approved in the 2019-21 biennium is just part of the funding required during the three biennium implementation and the ongoing operational costs thereafter. The overall costs and subsequent biennium requests were identified by the division in the 2019 budget hearings for the Department of Public Safety. 
During the 19th session, the NCGIS modernization program was approved to begin a phased replacement of the criminal justice information systems and subsystems that are maintained by the department and are part of the NCGIS environment or provide access to that environment. This program included eight includes eight full-time equivalent positions and approximately 11 contracted positions. In addition, there are three extensive vendor contracts to facilitate the transition from the existing NCGIS program to the modernized program. The NCGIS modernization program implementation effort is slated to run from July of 2020 through June of 2025. Unisys, the solutions vendor, is scheduled to deploy all modernized systems and functions by October of 23, as shown in the schedule on slide 18, which we will get to. Once all systems are deployed and functioning, the state will be performing operations and proof of functions from October of 23 through June of 25 to ensure that everything is working as required. After that, it will go into maintenance mode and future enhancements, which will require adequate funding. Additionally, we provide the interim finance committee with a quarterly letter of intent that contains the status, status of this effort. On to GO8. During the 2019 session, based upon meetings with the Division of Human Resource Management Administrator, DMV Director, Smart 21 Director, and the Governor's Finance Office Director, it was determined that the administrator of the NCGIS modernization program should be an unclassified position, position commensurate with the administrator of the Office of Project Management for both SMART 21 and the transformation effort ongoing in DMV. Unfortunately, the discussions to align these, these positions took place after the 2021 budget was submitted and budget closings occurred. Therefore, no technical adjustments were able to be made. Thus, the placeholder position as a classified criminal justice records manager took effect upon legislative approval at the close of the 1921 budget. This change was submitted as part of the budget process, but was not included in GovRec. As this is a very, as this is very important to our agency, a budget amendment has been submitted to the budget office that requests to rectify this in the 22-23 budget cycle. Now on to the Nevada Criminal Justice Information System, also referred to as NCGIS. NCGIS serves thousands of federal, state, and local criminal justice agencies in Nevada. It is the conduit for criminal justice agencies to access Nevada, FBI, other states, and international criminal justice information. It is managed by my division with the assistance of multiple IT vendors. Certain systems are utilized for civil purposes, such as employment, licensing, volunteers, firearms background checks, sex offender registration, etc. The Nevada files include fingerprint-based criminal history records, warrants, CCW permits, registered sex offenders, parole and probation, protection orders, Nevada offense codes, and DMV data. Files that are accessed directly in other states through a system called NLETS include the same files above, as well as Canadian files, Mexican commercial driver's license, corrections, wildlife violations, and as you can see, there are over 140 files in NLETS that are accessible. FBI files include gang terrorists, foreign fugitive, and all those listed there, and the FBI files have about 26 different files that can be accessed through our system. And CGIS interfaces and connects with multiple other systems, FBI systems previously mentioned, the Nevada DMV, and let's as previously mentioned for access to other states, SCOPE, which is a Clark County system, Nevada DPS parole and probation, multiple foreign host connections to other systems, such as records management systems, computer aided dispatch systems, and mobile computer terminals. And we also interface with our own internal systems here in the division, such as our computerized criminal history system, protection order program, sex offender registry, and our Nevada fence codes. The reason for the NCGIS modernization program. The current program is 20 plus years old with the proprietary owner retiring soon. It will help us meet our mission to provide accurate, timely, and complete criminal justice information for both criminal and civil purposes. It is a multi-biennial, multi-million dollar implementation effort to replace multiple complex criminal and civil systems, and it's introducing new systems and functionality as well. 
It has ongoing maintenance and future enhancements after implementation. It will improve functionality and customer service, be highly configurable for future changes, will automate for timeliness and efficiency, and it will allow the division and the state to comply with multiple federal and state mandates. Timeliness and efficiency, for example, includes fingerprint-based background checks for civil purposes, which are currently mostly manual that will become mostly automated with modernization. This means that the current time frame of anywhere between a two week to two month response time will be drastically reduced to mere days, allowing employers and licensing entities to conduct their business more expeditiously, resulting in people gaining employment faster. We planned by having um, staffing for success. So we assigned a dedicated program management office staffed with both contracted and full-time equivalent state positions. We took a program approach and not a project approach since this is a large program comprised of multiple projects. And we divided it into multi-biennial funding to make it more affordable since the cost will be spread out. The risks of doing nothing. There is a high risk of failure with catastrophic consequences. The current vendor will retire. He takes his current system with him. It belongs to him. It does not belong to us, which means it will no longer be accessible. Systems will become unsupported. Those systems that remain that we're not modernizing that do belong to the division, which creates a security risk and increased system downtime. State users could become non-compliant with federal and state mandates. Functionality will diminish. And worst case is public and officer safety risks with catastrophic consequences. This means that criminal justice agencies will have no means to search the system to obtain information for criminal investigations, intelligence, arrests, prosecution, sentencing, record seals, parole and probation, supervision, everything that they do. It supports tens of thousands of users, not only statewide, but nationwide, which will negatively affect public and officer safety. The state and the civil side will lose all ability to process any of the civil background check requests, which will affect public safety for the following fingerprint based background checks for our civil customers for employment, licensing, adoption, foster care, child care, CCW permits, volunteers, etc. As required by over 118 Nevada revised statutes, as well as other civil purposes, such as record seals and the Brady point of contact firearms background checks will no longer be able to be conducted and name based background checks for employment and volunteers will no longer be able to be conducted and we will not be able to register our sex offenders for state and national public awareness. There is no turning back once we got started the new solution environment is vastly different than the current environment. Once started it is technologically impossible to roll it back. Therefore, continued funding and support is essential to ensure public and officer safety statewide, nationwide, and internationally. And as promised on slide 18, here is the timeline for completion for the implementation. And of course, after implementation, we will have ongoing maintenance and enhancements. Enhancements come from state and federal mandates. Along with the mandates are the system changes that are implemented by the FBI, NLETS, and any other systems we interface with. That concludes budget account 4709. Chair, I'm happy to answer any questions you and the members may have. Okay, thank you. I know we have a couple of questions here. I'm gonna start with um, Assemblywoman uh, Monroe Moreno, and then we're gonna to go to Assemblywoman Tolles. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is on E225, the new program officer's position for the um, Brady point of contact background check. And in looking over the notes, it looks like you've had almost an 82% increase in background checks in 2020 over the 2019. Do you think the volumes, do you anticipate those volumes to remain at the same level? Or will they different um, as we move forward from what you saw in 2020? Mindy McKay, for the record, thank you for that question. You know, in the beginning of the pandemic, this was supposed to be temporary. Now we're a year into it. Um, normally, and then also last year, not only did we have the pandemic, but we had an election year and then we had some civil unrest, which has occurred throughout the years. Normally, after those start to settle down, we do see a decrease. We are hoping and praying that we do see a decrease in these numbers. 
um, but we are going to be actively seeking mitigation for um, the workload to help with that. We do have two, we have a grant where we do have the ability to pay for two temps to come in and help with some of the other program tasks. So we're hoping that that might help see some alleviation as well. Thank you for that. So is there a current backlog that exists? Um, because the supervisors have been going out providing outreach and training. So is there a current backlog? And if these two positions, or if this one position is um, approved, how do you think that will impact the service levels um, in the unit? Mindy McKay for the record. In regard to the current backlog, there's no backlog on the actual background checks for the firearms transfers, but we have other side jobs in the unit that have been placed, some of them have been placed on the back burner, which the temps we are hoping will help out to eliminate those backlogs. Um, for example, we enter information into the FBI NICS database so that it's visible nationwide. We enter statistics into a federal database so that the feds can have the state view of the statistics. Um, we do letters, whatever there's a request from a customer as to the reason why their status is their status. We respond to those letters. Um, there's a bunch of different tasks that they perform in there outside of an actual firearms transfer background check. So um, there is a backlog in those other areas, but is not in violation of the actual background check process. And then as far as the program officer one impacting the business, it will help alleviate the duties that are currently on the uh, program officer twos. We have two of those supervisors. They're actually managers. And they will, that's, this position will help those two be able to fo focus more on the higher level managerial tasks, such as le legislative session, reviewing bills and providing impact statements, such as um, creating the policies and procedures that run the, the bureau or the, um, the program. And um, overseeing the staff will help as well. And so it will, this one position, one position will help um, with some of the tasks, but again, we are going to have to continue to look at the numbers and see if we're going to have to go back to the drawing board. Thank you. And if I can, um, Mr. Chair, I just have one last question. Um, sure. What you just said kind of um, sparked something else in my head. Under E227, um, the, the two new administrative assistance positions. So when you talked about the backlog, would those positions help with the processing of the fingerprint cards for some of those occupational things other than um, background checks for, for gun ownership, for teachers, um, doctors, things like that. You get those fingerprint cards as well. Is, there a is that where the backlog is at? And um, how will these two new positions in regards to its management and the oversight of the original fingerprint cards records address that backlog for the disposition of all those, if that Mindy, makes sense. Mindy McKay, for the record, the two administrative assistant two positions reside in a unit called the criminal records unit. The criminal records unit is responsible for maintaining the state of Nevada's criminal history records. The processing of fingerprints for employment takes place in a different unit. It does not take place in the unit that the two new administrative assistant two positions will reside in. So the two new positions that you're referencing will not have any responsibilities over the processing of civil applicant fingerprint cards. So the civil applicant fingerprint cards, when those are processed, you're also looking for criminal history and the processing of those fingerprint cards as well in a separate unit, correct? Mindy McKay for the record. Yes, the criminal records unit maintains the criminal history records that then the other unit that process the, the fingerprints. Um, the, so the civil unit is the unit that processes the fingerprints for employment purposes and all the civil purposes. And they do access our criminal records unit system to gain that, to gain access to that state criminal history record. Thank you, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Let's go to um, Assemblywoman um, Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to ask a question. Um, I also wanna follow up a little bit on this E2225 or 225. Um, you mentioned, um, and first I have to acknowledge how organized you are. 
you have a lot on your plate. I appreciate how you presented and I appreciate what you do for the state of Nevada. It's a big lift. So thank you, Ms. McKay for that. Um, you mentioned that there's no backlog in some of these, um, but there are there can be delays. So could you clarify that to me? Because you mentioned right now that there can be a two week to a two month time on some of these backgrounds. So is that, and what unit is that in? And then I'll have a follow up. Mindy McKay for the record. So E225 is for our Brady Firearms Background Unit Program. Um, the two to two week to two month time frame is in our civil fingerprint unit background uh, program. So different programs, different units. Um, and so the the two to two week to two month is in our fingerprint civil unit. They process all the civil fingerprints for things such as employment, licensing, adoption, CCWs. And so um, E225 doesn't have anything to do with the uh, fingerprints. Great, thank you for that clarification. Back on slide eight, you mentioned some of those background checks and, and then we looked at the number of, of folks, uh, myself included, who have CCWs and we end up on that background check. And I'm, uh, I'm pleased to see that maybe you're gonna try to lower that delay in time on those background checks. What I'm hearing complaints from my constituents are the ones who are doing the firearm transfers and they have had um, the firearm dealers when they do that private party transfer that now is mandated if they receive a firearm in, they have been uh, concerned about some delays there. Has that been um, shortened? Um, and if not, will this new position help shorten that delay? Mindy McKay for the record. There are two ways that a firearm dealer can contact us to conduct a background check. They can call on the phone. And then if they get through on the phone, then they get their um, background check conducted that day. Now there could be, it could be placed into a delayed status. And then we have three business days to reach back out to the dealer to give them a final status on that. The second way that they can reach out to us for a background check is via fax. They can fax us the document and then we would data enter that into the system. And um, Erica Susie Yamas, Records Bureau Chief, are you aware of what the current time frame is for the faxes? Um, Yes, it is. I think we're about two or three days behind. Erica Suzyamas, for the record, we are currently about two or three days behind on the faxed um, forms for uh, Brady Firearm background checks. Thank you. Sorry well, for that. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. So on that particular um, unit, then, will either the new program uh, analyzer or your NC just uh, new system, will that help improve that time? Mindy McKay for the record. And CJUS modernization is going to help improve a lot of our program timeframes. It will include improving the Brady background checks because what the new modernization is going to provide is a portal option. The portal is going to be utilized, can be utilized by the, the federal firearms licensed gun dealers to enter their own. They won't have to call us, they won't have to fax us. They can data enter their own background checks through the portal. So that will save time for them, save time for us, and create more efficiency and more electronic um, transfer of information. In addition, the NCGIS modernization program is going to automate the fingerprint for civil, whereas the portal will be used by our applicants. And um, on that statistical slide, you saw that we have over 2000 civil applicant accounts. Every one of those accounts will have an account through the portal, whereas they can receive, retrieve and receive their responses through the portal electronically along with their billing. A follow-up question, Mr. Chair? Um, and I'm sorry for this continuing on here, but go ahead. You mentioned early uh, on that the one of the problems and the need to, to switch over to the census is that the current system is has a private ownership, and this person's retiring and and taking with them the ownership. So are we making sure we're not in this situation again, where we get where we somebody owns this and the state then is at a loss if that person takes it away? Mindy McKay, for the record. Yes, ma'am. And that is the reason why we contracted with a large, um, historically well-known company called Unisys. They are a corporation. They are, they are international, probably. Um, and so we are hoping that this never happens again because we have contracted with the company Unisys, who has been around for ages. They're proven and they're all over the place. They're a large corporation. So that's our mitigation. Again, thank you for the questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your responses, Ms. McKay. I appreciate all you're doing. Thank, thank you. Um, just a real quick follow-up on the last question. Um, the, 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 
the programmer that developed it owns the program, right? But we own the data. Is that correct? Mindy McKay, for the record, that is correct, sir. Yeah, so we just have to transfer the data over to the new system. So, okay, um, I have a question on 227. Um, you're, you're adding two new administrative assistants, and my question is uh, what benefits does the agency expect to get from these new positions in regard to management and oversight of the original fingerprint, uh, fingerprint card records and also in addressing its back, the backlog of dispositions to be entered into the system? Mindy McKay, for the record, so you don't have to hear me every time. I'm going to have Erica Susie Yamas answer that, and I apologize again for the movement of the computer. Good morning, members of the committee. This is Erica Susie Yamas, for the record. Uh, the two administrative assistant twos for the criminal records unit um, is going to assist the program in its entirety in balancing all of the workloads. So they're not just going to be specific for disposition data entry. Um, as Mindy stated earlier, that program is responsible for criminal record maintenance, fingerprint card maintenance, uh, court ordered record seals, temporary protection orders. So these two positions will just help balance, better balance the workloads with existing staff to make sure that we don't fall into a backlog situation. Okay. Um, all right. And then uh, you, you, you addressed this earlier. I just don't know if, if you, the specific thing, but if you did, then, then just ditto it, but um, you talked about NCGIS, um, and how is that going to improve the efficiencies of the dis disposition receipt and empty for the criminal records? Erica Susie Yamas, for the record, um, we anticipate some efficiencies with the NCGIS modernization in the criminal records unit. Um, at some point down the road, we're looking to automate the dispositions that we receive manually today, which would uh, relieve staff from having to perform the, the manual data entry of the, that workload. Um, Mindy did indicate earlier in her testimony that um, it's the modernization is still a few years down the road. And we're also going to need time to develop those interfaces between our agency and the local agencies to transmit that data to us. So it's it's going to be a ways down the road before we can realize some of those benefits with the disposition workloads. Okay. And, and so then I, this, this next question goes along with that. So if you're going to have those efficiencies, uh, is that an administrative assistant that we're adding going to be necessary once you complete NCGIS and get it all up and running and fully operational? At this, Erica Susianas, for the record, at this time, I, I anticipate being still needing the, the two administrative assistant twos. Um, we, like I mentioned earlier, we still have um, additional workloads that will not be automated through the modernization. We have our court ordered criminal uh, criminal history record seals. Um, we do manual data entry into the protection order system on behalf of courts. Um, we have a large fingerprint vault of manual criminal fingerprint cards that are maintained. Um, those fingerprint cards are accessed daily. Um, and we need to be able to maintain those cards in an orderly fashion, um, somebody to help pull the files and, and put them back in the proper order. So I anticipate we'll still need the, the two AA2s in the future. So do you, is, do you don't have anybody currently doing those things? We don't, Erica Susiyamas, for the record, we don't currently have somebody dedicated to monitoring the vault. Um, it can at times get very disorderly. Um, we've noticed that some of the criminal fingerprints are getting damaged due to the amount of filing that has to be done. Um, we do have staff that are working on the court ordered record seals and the protection orders. Um, workloads are just heavier on those staff members, existing staff members. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, anyone else have any questions on E227 on this particular part of it? Uh, not seeing anyone. Okay. Um, and then one more question on the E228, which, which is the management analyst three. Um, the... Uh, are there any duties that are not being addressed due to the lack of resources in the fiscal unit? Mindy McKay, for the record, um, I have with me today Lisa Galloway, Chief Financial Officer. This position, she, Lisa is an Administrative Services Officer 3. She is the only budget analyst that I have within my division to run the 45 million plus dollar budget. And um, when 
not if, because everybody leaves eventually, when she leaves us, we need to be able to have a position that backs that her position up so that we have that succession planning. So especially during the, the heavy budget cycles, when we're building the budgets and we're getting ready for session, it's really important for us to have that succession planning, God forbid, whenever a position becomes available, but also to help carry the workload. It is a very large, complex, um, number three different budgets that we have. Um, one budget, 4702, is very complex because it's our cost allocated budget. And so it, she needs some help and the, the fiscal unit needs some help with oversight, with policy building, implementation, and responding to all of our budget um, requests and requirements. Lisa, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I would just, Lisa Galloway, for the record, I would just add that, you know, the next position uh, below mine is a management analyst too, which is a contract our contract manager and so uh, to get any other fiscal response we have to go down to the, the admin tech techs that are in our unit um, and so there is not a lot of support for my position you know they're great to help out but but as far as the budget side of things there's there's not any other support okay all right thank you very much anyone else have any questions on e228 Okay. All right. So that's all the questions that we have for that budget. So I guess we're ready to move on to the next one. Okay. I will go ahead and share my screen again. Mindy McKay for the record. Okay. Hold please. How does that look? Hopefully you see slide 18 with the we're seeing your notes, so. Oh, it's still in the notes. Hmm. We see the screen, but also your notes. So you gotta do the full screen. Okay, let me let me just start this over again real quick. Come back up here just one more second. Are you seeing it yet? I see the I see your the program itself. You just need to hit the whatever to, to actually bring up the How does that shows us, that's showing us your your notes yeah. on the there you go. Okay. There we go. Oh, okay, we'll get this down by the end of session. <laughs> All right. You're going to go to slide 19. Budget account 4702 is within the Communications Bureau. The Communications Bureau includes dispatch services for DPS and some allied agencies. They coordinate with local public safety agencies on critical incidents, perform FBI CGIS systems agency tasks, and perform warrant tasks for some allied agencies. The other disparate positions include one position dedicated as the DPS administrator of the Spillman system used by Department of Public Safety for dispatch and records management functions. We also have a department IT liaison who assists DPS employees with various IT activities. We also have a department terminal agency coordinator responsible for providing access, training, and auditing specific to NCGIS, and a few dedicated fiscal staff to run the budget. As discussed during the 211 of 21 DPS budget hearing between Assemblywoman Peters and Deputy Director Brueggemann, we have historically had challenges recruiting and retaining dispatchers due to pay disparity. Due to this inability to hire and retain employees, our overtime runs around $500,000 a year because we have to staff the operations 24-7, 365. And I believe you heard the same challenge of, challenges with Highway Patrol. On the next slide is a pie chart to depict in blue, 69% is dispatch services cost allocation. In orange is 31% of the department cost allocation. 
Um, sorry, this is broadcast. Um, we actually need you to stop your uh, screen share. If you can start it back up, we are not seeing it on the live broadcast. You can go ahead and bring it back up again. Give us one moment to make sure we can see. How does that look? Okay, we are all good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Going back to slide 21. Mindy McKay for the record. In 4702 E225, the division seeks to employ a program officer one position to provide the necessary coverage and services to 2000 plus users from over 40 agencies statewide and provide an avenue for succession training for the administration of the Spillman system. The agencies outside DPS that utilize the Spillman system pay their own maintenance fees. DPS costs allocates to its internal users. The other decision units are standard replacement requests. I'm happy to review them if you have any questions, but for brevity, I hadn't planned on going through each one individually. If anyone is interested in meeting with me and my staff to discuss any of our programs in more detail, please reach out to me. We can talk about each of our programs for hours as they are all complex. We are available to provide additional information throughout session to assist you with your arduous tasks and important decisions to help this succession be successful. This session be successful. I want to commend legislative staff, legislators and their respective staff for doing a wonderful job despite our current challenges. As well, I'd like to thank the other agencies in the state who have reached out to us regarding various legislation. Everyone has been helpful, responsive, kind, understanding, patient and cooperative. I want to take this opportunity to publicly commend my division staff, as well as the department staff and our leadership for their hard work and dedication throughout the years, but especially during this pandemic. Go team. That concludes my presentation. I appreciate your time today. It was great to see all of you, and we look forward to working with you throughout this session. We are happy to answer any questions. Okay, I know we have um, uh, Assemblywoman Miller. A couple of questions on the, on this one. Thank you, Chair. My first question is, um, as you briefly covered, uh, if we could have some more specifics on who actually participates in the cost sharing for the ongoing maintenance and salary to administer the Spillman um, system. Yes, Lisa Galloway for the record. Um, the Spillman maintenance costs uh, currently are paid by uh, DPS agencies. They are paid by uh, any of our agencies that have sworn positions in them, which are uh, parole and probation, division of investigations, uh, DPS training, the state fire marshal's office, highway patrol, uh, motor carrier, and Capitol Police and Dignitary Protection. Okay. Also, um, can, can you describe right now what current issues you have with only having one staff dedicated to the administration of the Spillman system? And, and also with that, if you could explain how the new position would actually help address those issues. Mindy McKay for the record. Again, with succession planning, it's always smart to have a backup. So we only have one administrator for Spillman within the department. And should that position become vacant, should that incumbent want to take time off, um, you know, take an extended leave, um, want to, they, and, and the workload on that one position because of the fact that they are for the entire department. And again, the department has, the, it utilizes Spillman not only for records management, but also our CAD, our dispatch CAD, computer-aided dispatch system. So the department alone uses a wide variety of the functions of Spillman. And therefore, um, and I believe the department has about 1,400 staff uh, because of the large amount of users and the large amount of uh, modules that are utilized within Spillman the time that it takes for one person to address all of those users needs as far as training, 
uh, uh, follow up or refresher training, onboarding new staff, system troubleshooting system issues, working with the vendor to upgrade systems to fix issues. It's very taxing on that person and the incumbent tends to work overtime, weekends, evenings. And so having a backup for succession planning is always smart. And then again, also to help with the workload since it is a large system with a large amount of users. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, any other questions on this budget? Okay, I'm not seeing or hearing any. All right. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we will now move on to the uh, fire marshal budget um, 101-3816. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Uh, keep speaking, it, it sounds like you're a little soft, but go ahead. This and this is Sherry Brigaman, um, Deputy Director with the Department of Public Safety. I just wanted to introduce our Fire Marshal, Mike Desac. Good morning, committee. Uh, my name is Mike Desac, and I am your State Fire Marshal. Uh, today, I'll be presenting the 2021 20, uh, State Fire Marshal Division budget. Uh, if you have any questions at any time, uh, feel free to uh, ask away. Uh, Kim Smith is going to put my presentation uh, up, if that's okay. All right. Uh, go ahead, Kim. Thank you. Next slide, Kim. All right, there's our uh, mission and uh, vision statements as, uh, as I'll discuss in, the, in our uh, short uh, presentation. Uh, we have a lot of different facets for such a small uh, division. Go ahead, Kim. This slide uh, represents the majority of the mandates the state fire marshal is responsible for. While Nevada revised statute 477 gives us our authority and our general responsibilities, you can see how many other statutes affect the division on one level or another. This is our organizational chart. It's uh, simply color coded by uh, responsibilities and uh, bureaus. Fire Protection Bureau is responsible for plan reviews and inspections for a wide variety of building types and includes the annual inspections on certain facilities. The plans examiners in this bureau not only review plans, but review variance requests and are a major component of the code adoption process. The licensing bureau handles all facets of Nevada's fire protection industry. From the testing of individuals in the varying fields of fire protection, such as blasters, pyrotechnic operators, and fire performers, to name a few, to the companies that employ those individuals. This bureau is also responsible for issuing statewide hazardous material storage certificates for those companies that store hazardous materials throughout the state without regard for population size. The information obtained in this program is, is available to fire departments statewide so they may develop pre-fire plans that include the types and amounts of hazardous chemicals stored in the facilities that they may be called to respond to. This bureau also manages the fire safe cigarette and compliance program, which is used for fire prevention and education programs throughout the state. The fire service training bureau is responsible to provide varying types of training to Nevada's first responders. They in conjunction with the national board or the Nevada board of fire services adopt standards and training requirements, as well as planning and delivering training to both volunteer and paid department personnel. This bureau also applies for and maintains the International Accredited Certification Congress or IFSAC certifications for Nevada's firefighters, which allow reciprocal certification in 48 states in the United States. The uh, Fire Investigation Enforcement Bureau is the sworn Category 1 law enforcement arm of the division. This bureau handles fire arson, insurance fraud, explosion, burn injury, and regulatory investigations throughout the state. While most of their responsibilities lie in the more rural counties, they are frequently requested to assist the larger counties, as we will discuss later in the presentation. 
Additionally, the investigators are trained and certified in inspections, so they're qualified to assist the Fire Protection Bureau, making them an extremely versatile asset to the division. Excuse me, committee. I apologize for the interruption. This is broadcast in oh. production services. Um, Sir, we're having trouble hearing you to the live broadcast. We can hear you on the Zoom call, but perhaps if you could uh, sit closer to your microphone or um, speak up a little bit, the acoustics in the room are just uh, making it a little hard to hear you, sir. How's that? Is that better? Um, it might be a little bit better. Can you try speaking um, just a little bit more directly to the microphone. I, can't, I don't know, I can get closer here. How's that? Keep talking so we can hear it. Okay, uh, how's that? Is that any better? Sounds like you're getting closer to the mic, which is good. That's much, if you can get any closer to the mic, that would be great. I'm, I'm right up on it. Okay. All right. All right. What slide are we on here? Division of Conflict Defense. All right. Um, you have in front of you some of the uh, division accomplishments as broken out by each bureau. While I'll not read the slides verbatim, I'd like to briefly touch on some of the highlights to clarify the importance of their respective duties. The Fire Protection Bureau has introduced the ability to, of the division to accept and review plans submitted through the use of blue beam technology. As many contractors have the ability to develop construction plans digitally, we lack the ability to review them, spending money on shipping huge rolls of documents back and forth. The licensing bureau has uh, finally acquired a vendor for the new database, which will not only allow the division to manage all of Nevada's fire protection companies and technicians, but will also be able to issue certificates of registration with the individual's photograph, which was something the industry called for. This will allow fire inspectors from the entire state to see that the individual certified to do the work on these systems is the same person that's standing in front of them. This bureau is also utilizing the fire standard compliance cigarette funds to develop and implement a joint effort fire prevention and education campaign that will reach the entire state. COVID-19 has presented numerous obstacles to traditional techniques used for safety and education outreach. And I'm proud of the cooperative uh, effort that we've been able to develop to utilize different social media uh, outlets to get important messages out to our citizens and visitors. Go ahead, next slide, Kim. Go ahead in the next slide, Kim. Um, All right, we had a little technical issue. We should be on that next slide now. All right, thank you. All right, Fire Service Training Bureau has put themselves at the forefront of fire investigation training mobile technology. On this slide, you can see a photograph of Nevada's newest and we believe the United States only mobile fire investigation training trailer. This trailer is designed to be outfitted with everything a normal room in a residential home would have, such as chairs, sofas, beds, drapes, and pictures. Then the room is set on fire using a method known only to the instructors. Thermal couples installed in the walls of the room allow the instructors to monitor the fire's progress from the outside, and fire-resistive cameras capture the fire behavior and progression. The room is then extinguished by fire crews, and the students must, using the information they've learned regarding fire behavior, determine the origin and cause of the fire. The students can then watch the video and determine whether or not their hypothesis was correct. Maybe the most valuable part of this training lies in our ability to deliver it anywhere in the state rather than having a fixed facility that the students would have to travel to. The trailer is having a test burn tomorrow on the training grounds at Carson City Fire Department Station 52 by the airport. If any of you would like to attend, you are welcome to meet me out there. And uh, the actual fire will be ignited at approximately 9.30. Uh, as uh, stated earlier in the presentation, the Investigation Enforcement Bureau is multifaceted and their expertise is employed throughout the state without regard for population caps. This bureau led the Argenta Hall Explosion Investigation Team at UNR under extremely hazardous conditions. When multiple buildings in downtown Lovelock caught fire, the investigators of this bureau determined the cause to be arson and located the exact point of origin for the fire. 
They confronted the suspect and obtained a confession with the arsonist giving them the exact location for the start of the fire that the team had already determined using the evidence and their training. During the initial civil unrest in Reno, state fire marshal investigators were deployed to assist the Nevada Highway Patrol in closing off interstate highway ramp exits and staged to protect commercial buildings. They also assisted Capitol Police during major protests on state Capitol grounds. As you can see from this slide, the division's budget and revenue streams are extremely diversified and complex. It should be noted that the volunteer firefighter plates funding stream is not a division revenue, but a collection point for all of those funds to be distributed to the Nevada Firefighters Association. E380 is for an additional plans examiner too. This position is extremely important in our plan review process. The division has struggled with one full-time plan reviewer supported by the contract plan reviewers to meet reasonable review turnaround times. The industry standard is approximately 10 days, which for our part can only be met with additional full-time staff. Our ability to quickly review and return plans has a direct effect on the construction industry and the economy as it relates to local governments. Uh, we are currently at uh, an average of 34 days or over a month in our turnaround. E382 is the uh, EATS database management uh, maintenance. Uh, E710 is computer replacements. E711 is a vehicle replacement for the Fire Protection Bureau. E712 is a three year average for general equipment replacement, uh, mostly in the investigations. And that is all I have, and I will field any questions anyone might have. Great, thank you. Um, uh, and Watts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I just wanted to quickly go back to uh, what was discussed around the um, additional planning position, plan review. Uh, so you said that uh the review times are basically three times above what the standard is and that it has um, impacts on uh, construction and other activities can you just elaborate a little bit more about the impacts of those delayed turnaround times oh absolutely mike dizak for the record uh when a company, when you, when, when something wants to get uh, built um, predominantly in the rural counties or in the Clark County School District, which is the largest school district west of the Mississippi, those plans are submitted to us for fire life safety review. Um, construction cannot start, whether it's a hood and duct system at UNR for one of the new uh, food courts or whether it's a wing to a school, they cannot start until we review the plans and approve them and check for everything from fire flow to the effective systems. Um, this puts the delay on that, and and we get you know we get calls, we get requests, and uh, uh, just you know for for a background information, I've been with the division uh, over 20 years, and when I got here, there were five plans examiners full time, and uh, now there's just the one, and uh, we're doing more in in uh, more with a lot less. The contract plan reviewers, while helpful are, are not getting us there. We have to be, we have to be more responsive to this. Uh, uh, you can't, uh, you, for example, uh, the, like a Dollar General store, okay? That's not a specific statute that the state fire marshal addresses, but if it's being built in a place in say Esmeralda County that doesn't really have a building official, um, we would take up that whole thing. And now they have to wait until they get started and, and the business can't start up and construction can't start up. and. It's, it's not good for anyone. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I just have one quick follow-up. So um, how, what's the impact that you expect this one additional uh, position to have in terms of reducing that uh, delay? Uh, in other words, how close will it get us from the 30 plus days towards the, the 10 days? That's our goal. Uh, you know, uh, it, I guess it depends Plans are a, a weird animal in that you can get a school plan review and the plans come in if they're if they're not digital they look like telephone poles and there's eight of them. And then some are uh, simple basic um, uh, upgrades or additions. Um, so I, I would anticipate a significant um, drop, which is what we're going for. We can still rely on the contract plans. Um, um, the uh, the bureau chief uh, Al Ruiz he can. Uh, maybe send some of the smaller plans to the contractors so that 
the two full-time uh, plan reviewers can uh, uh, handle the larger plans. Um, I, I guess I, I don't have a specific number on you, but I, I, I know it has nowhere to go but, but up for us. Uh, additional staffing is, is critical at this point. And uh, hopefully if the budget is approved, um, you know, the, it's a, plans as a, a fee-based uh, uh, issue. So we can then address um, if we can speed up the plans and get the plan turnaround faster, uh, it could uh, result in, in more revenue. Um, and, and rather than worrying about um, the, the, the cost savings, I, I, we just we need more bodies in this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Any other questions here? Uh, Senator uh, Senator Gokachia. And then I see Chair. And uh, yeah, Mike, I'm just kind of concerned. I know you can have interlocal agreements with uh, especially out in the rural, say, the city of Wells or the city of Wendover. But how many of those do you have actually in place and so that you have the ability for them to do some of the plan reviews rather than you? Uh, you know, uh, Senator, uh, again, Mike Dezak for the record, uh, I don't have the exact number, but we do have significant uh, interlocal agreements uh, throughout some of the more rural uh, uh, counties. Um, the, uh, they've elected, a lot of them have elected to go to outside uh, private entities to do their plan review. And, uh, regardless of those, we're still responsible statutorily for uh, an audit of those. We have to make sure, um, especially when, when you start contracting to private entities, um, Nevada is unique in that you, you don't get to just follow the building codes and fire codes. You also have to follow the uh, Nevada administrative code. And we have some of the more restrictive measures in there. We have to make sure they're doing it. We have to make sure they're meeting fire flow requirements in some of these rural places uh, or they're adding fire pumps and, and doing some special uh, uh, assessments. And uh, I know, uh, you know we use the term vari uh, variance, but uh, it's more of an alternative means and methods. And we, we're the only ones that can approve those. So um, even though we might give the interlocal to uh, say Elko County for, for uh, their needs, um, they, if there's a, a variance request or an alternative means and methods, only the state fire marshal can approve those. So it's not like we, we get off Scott clean with interlocals. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And that was a point I was trying to bring forward, no matter how it's done, even if it's done with a contractor, uh, say in one of those rural jurisdictions, ultimately you still have to sign off. You or your staff. Correct, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you. Um, Send the woman polls. Just thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few questions. It's all right. Um, I, uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Marshall, for your presentation. And you mentioned the Pine Haven fire and collaboration there. That's in my district. And so thank you for uh, your engagement there. But that brings me just to some questions. We've had 63 homes in that particular neighborhood or destroyed since 2011. And it's because it butts right up to BLM land and forestry. So I just um, saw that you coordinate with um, fire management and forestry. Could you help unpack for me a little bit better how you two work together? Because, you know, that's certainly the circumstances in my district where we have a lot of dense neighborhoods right up against um, open uh, forestry land. And so we, and with high winds, we get a lot of activity there where it can rapidly turn into a um, major fire situation. So what what role do you play in coordinating on that wildfire detection and response? Thank you, Senator Tolles. Uh, this is Mike Dezak for the record. Um, actually, uh, um, uh, Senator Gokichi is sitting on one of the, the other uh, committees. Uh, the forester, the state forester, fire warden has um, receded in their duties as far as a, a uh, all, all risk um, uh, uh, fire department, um, they're looking to uh, kind of get away from, from that aspect. And uh, since I already adopt the International uh, Building Code, Fire Code uh, as a minimum standard, um, we're now going to be adopting the uh, wildland urban interface um, in, in an, I guess, a more official capacity. Um, I think the general consensus is that local entities are best suited uh, for those types of events. Uh, things, you know, a, a, a wildland uh, and heavy fuel 
in uh, Lyon County is different than a heavy fuel that might be in Douglas County. Um, so the locals are best to handle that. And what, what, what I do is when by adopting those, those minimum standards to say, you can be more stringent, you can add the fire sprinkler requirements to those, um, you can add your defensible space requirements to those, um, but you have to apply those minimum standards. And then it, you know, if you can't, then, then you're, you're operating outside of, uh, of uh, what the law states. Does that does that help? I mean, I I, don't, I have four investigators statewide. We're not we're not able to to handle that on a on a state you know uh, specific uh, location. Uh, yeah, we have two inspectors, one in the north, one in the south, and a contract inspector in the south. So um, what we're trying to do is is assist the locals by giving them that base code. You and I I think think that helps in regards to the the codes and the buildings and structures, but. I think my question more was in terms of fire detection and just um, how a, a wildfire just a, a few miles away can turn into a real threat to a neighborhood or a, um, a community pretty quickly. So what methods do we use? And I think more specifically, do we utilize things like um, cameras to detect, oh, there's a wildfire that happened just, you know, five miles away and it's with the winds heading our direction. Do we... Do we utilize those? Is that in this budget? I couldn't see anything in your budget or in the forestry fire suppression budget um, to utilize those kind of methods to more quickly see that the threat is coming so that we could stop it before it even one home is destroyed. Yes, thank you, uh, Mike Dizak for the record. Um, that is more of a uh, fire suppression entity um, that would be left to uh, those responding units. The, the state fire marshal has no fire trucks. Um, we're, we're, we, we are more in the business of fire resistive construction of uh, 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 the, the finding and punishment of arson. Um, we're, we're not, that's not, that's not something that, that's in uh, NRS 477 for us, um, but I'd be happy to discuss it with you offline, and, and I, I can actually uh, reach out through the uh, Nevada Board of Fire Services to, to find out if uh, any of the uh, Northern Nevada Fire Chiefs and Southern Chiefs are looking into this. Thank you. That That's very helpful. I appreciate that. We I believe we have that budget on Thursday, so that just sort of helps me to know where to direct my questions, because I think we've, we do have a great opportunity there to help um, with those, that prevention piece. And so hope you do your job well too, and um, hopefully prevent those situations in the future. So that was, that was perfect thing, answer. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on this budget? Okay, we'll go ahead and close this budget. Um, and we will um, actually, let me, let me give some instruction here because we're going to run out of time. So we've got a lot of budgets we have to do. So as you come up to do your presentations, we need you to give the real quick version of the presentation because we got to get straight. We got to get some answers um, on some of the things that we've looked through as we've looked through the budget. So um, with that, um, just keep that in mind as you're getting ready to do your presentations here. Um, the next one is the highway safety plan and admin, which is uh, budget account 101 4688. Yes, good morning. Uh, this is Amy Davy with the Office of Traffic Safety. Um, I'm the administrator for the office. And in fact, I was going to offer to cut our presentation short. I know that we're towards the end of um, the Department of Public Safety's time this morning. So I'm happy to um, present both 4688 and 4691, the Motorcycle Safety Program. Joining me today, I have our um, Chief Fiscal Officer. Um, so I believe that we can answer any questions that you may have. Um, and we can go ahead then and skip to slide 10 on our presentation, which addresses our budget requests. This is for budget account 4688. These are our um, uh, enhancement requests for the coming biennium. Um, E710, you can see, is our equipment replacement. Um, E800, our internal cost allocations. We have a request for uh, an upgrade to um, an unclassified position in our organization, primarily funded with federal funds. And um, finally, E901, 
um, reflects um, a request that you saw earlier in the NHP's budget, which is a transfer of a management analyst position overseeing the admission interlock program to the Nevada Highway Patrol. On 4688, do you have any questions for us? Okay, it seemed that I had a technical issue myself there for a second. I think I'm back. Um, I missed the last minute. So I, we do have some questions on this um, budget. I believe um, uh, uh, Senator Brooks has a question. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my, my question is, is regarding uh, E815 um, and it's really about the salary of that, that position. Can you explain how the agency determined the recommended salary level for the Office of Traffic Safety Administrator um, and how the positions span of control and duties are compatible to that of the Office of Cyber Defense Coordination Administrator that it was compared to? Thank you. Yes. Uh Thank you for the question. This is um, Amy Davy with the Office of Traffic Safety. I'm actually going to defer to um, headquarters. Um, the position upgrade is in our budget, but it was a uh, um, director's office um, request, and um, I'll let them let them respond as well as our um, fiscal officer who did the research on that position. And this is Sherry Brigaman, deputy director, for the record, and. We did make the recommendation that we upgrade the salary for the administrator for Office of Traffic Safety um, for a number of reasons, I think, that are, have been explained. Um, but the number one reason for going with the administrator for OCDC salary is that the duties seem more commensurate with that position. And this administrator has been... Um, uh, lacking in terms of um, a good uh, salary for the duties that are done, handling three of the major budget accounts, being the funnel for an awful lot of our um, uh, uh, federal funding and grants. So uh, the general program has been redirected and works closely with NDOT management as well as a number of other um, state level employees and our federal partners. We feel strongly that this position really needs to be um, classified along with all other positions of its like. Um, and this was the lowest paid. It was also a problem because we have still not been able to fill our um, ASO position um, because there's just no fiscal people available. Um, and we haven't been able to classify it properly because it bumps up against the administrator salary, which as I pointed out is too low. So that's how we went about doing it. Um, answer any specific questions. Oh, well, thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, any other questions on this budget? Um, I don't see anyone. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that'll do it for that budget. And so now we'll move on to the next budget, which is uh, 101 4693 Motorcycle Safety Program. Yes, Kim, if you would um, uh, forward to slide 13. Uh, 4691. This is the budget account for the Nevada Rider Statewide Motorcycle Safety Program. Uh, this budget account is um, uh, fee funded. Um, we have, uh, uh, I'm just waiting on the next, maybe one more slide. I'm sorry, number 14. Um, there are enhancement requests for this budget. Uh, we have a small amount that we've requested in E225 um, for outreach uh, and media. Um, our writer coach instructor training is E226. Um, E227 and E228 were two uh, enhancement units that in coordination with our work with um, LCB, we uh, have been eliminated um, and so we're no longer in our budget. 
Um, and then you see um, in-state travel, vehicle maintenance, equipment replacement for our motorcycle fleet, uh, training fleet, and our internal cost allocation. Do we have any questions on, on this budget? We do. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Assemblyman Monroe Moreno. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One of my questions was answered during the presentation, and thank you so much for the presentation. You are eliminating the request for the eighty-five thousand per year for the recommended um, the media campaign. That correct. Yes. Yes, we did reduce um, our budget um, by 85,000 in order to maintain um, proper reserves. Um, and so what you see in there is just a small amount to um, do some outreach, primarily in Southern Nevada. Okay, thank you. And what benefits would be achieved for the motorcycle safety program by funding a contracted outreach coordinator in Southern Nevada? Absolutely. Uh, Amy Davey, Office of Traffic Safety. I'm, I'm happy to answer that question. This is something that we've been considering for quite a long time. This program really staffs two full-time um, people, um, and the rest is done through uh, contract training uh, and contract services. We, we currently do not have a representative in Southern Nevada, and we work um, quite extensively with the training programs down there and with um, uh, motorcycle dealerships. Additionally, some of Nevada's largest motorcycle events um, uh, are, are in um, Southern Nevada, Las Vegas Bike Fest and Laughlin River Run. Um, so it's important for us to have a presence and to be able to reach out to the community to discuss um, safety um, approaches. And um, we've been bringing our northern nevada staff down um, in order to attend those events and um, we just really feel that by having a part-time um, person available in las vegas we'll be able to better engage with the with the motorcycling community thank you mr chair um can i ask a question on e226 yes so what what is the distinction between the 15-day rider coach training um, program, the course, and the annual instructor certifications? And how would this benefit the motorcycle safety program? I'm sure I have my information. Would you like to respond to this question? I'm not sure that I have that um, information in front of me. This is Tammy Trio for the record, the fiscal officer for Office of Traffic Safety. Um, so I, in E226, we did a reduction, um, which is will be in G08, governor's uh, recommend 08. It's an amendment. So rider coach trainer, I, I think, that's the line item that you're referencing in the 15 day certification course. It, so the reason why, let, let me start with, the, we put this in the budget because we have one person um, who ha is retiring, who is a, an instructor, a certified instructor, a coach trainer. And um, one of our other employees, which was one of our permanent PCNs, um, actually received a promotion. So we have to um, train two new people or have two new people trained. And this is the certification 15 days for them to actually be able to instruct the courses. So I, I know there was another part to that question, but as far as annual certification, I, I, I'm not sure where I see that in our request. This is just the 15 day certification course, so. Thank you, and, and you did confirm in your explanation the reduction in the amount. Mr. Chair, I don't think I have any other questions. I, I, I did have one in E227, and looking at the community college tuition subsidies, it seems as I look at the notes um, that the Truckee Meadows Community College 
program is the only one that really receives um, the subsidies. Um, is there an explanation why that program is in need of it? More often than the other community colleges? This is um, Amy Davey, Office of Traffic Safety. We survey all of our community college partners um, every year to determine um, how their, um, if their programs are maintaining adequate support um, for their institutions and if they're going to require any subsidies. Um, and we request backup documentation related to, you know, costs and the, the revenues that are collected um, in order to determine if a subsidy is, um, is needed. Um, Truckee Meadows Community College is the only college that has uh, requested a subsidy um, and has provided the backup documentation um, to show that um, they are in need of that support. But it's available to every um, college that runs these programs. So the, the base um, budget funding of about the 5,400 is that sufficient to provide the tuition subsidy to Truckee? Tammy, can you respond to that question? I don't know if your look like your camera wasn't working. Can you repeat the question, please, Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno? Sure. In um, E227, my question is, so in that decision unit, can it be eliminated because there would be enough funding available in the base budget funding to provide the tuition subsidies that Truckee Meadows Community College would need? Um, Amy Davy with the Office of Traffic Safety, I show that we have eliminated E227 um, in, in a follow-up request. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the answer. And I have no further questions. Thank you. Um, uh, Sunlumen Watts, did you have some questions on this? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just very briefly. So I, I know you just touched on E227. Uh, I just wanted to bring up E228, which I did see in your uh, slide presentation, noted was eliminated. And I just want to uh, very quickly confirm that with you, that it is eliminated. Yes, um, this is Amy Davey with the Office of Traffic Safety. We did eliminate that item also as we learned that um, the Motorcycle Safety Foundation, where we received our curriculum, is rewriting this curriculum and it won't be available um, for us to access. So um, we did eliminate this uh, request. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Do we have any other questions on this item? Switch to the gallery view. I'm looking for hands. I don't see any. Okay. Um, let's. Uh, so we'll close that budget. Um, let's go to uh, 101-3673, Division of Emergency Management. Hello, this is Sherry Brigaman, Deputy Director for the Department of Public Safety, and I'd like to introduce to you our Chief of Emergency Management, Dave Bogerson, who will be assisted with his fiscal manager, Justin Luna. Thank you. Thank you, Committee and, and Deputy Director Bergman for the introduction. Dave Bogerson with Division of Emergency Management for the record. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we will get through our, we have a lengthy presentation, but we will get through it and let you look at it at your leisure rather than at our leisure and we'll get our budget. I'm going to talk about a couple of items as we move forward, just to make sure that there's some idea on what division emergency management does, but I know that we've got a bigger question at the end that we probably is going to take up most of our time. So DM is Nevada's essential emergency disaster coordinating partner right now. Uh, COVID response really highlights what emergency management does, getting all the partners together, and we're managing $138 million worth of grants related to COVID alone, in addition to our normal allotment of about $70 million worth of the grant funds that we're managing for full state and local government resources. So, I want to just clarify that emergency management's not the field responders, we're not first responders, we're not the first line of defense. 
We're the ones that come after the incident happens or during the incident to support our local governments. We use preventing, protecting, mitigating, responding, and recovery from that disaster. And we look at it as a cyclic event. We try to prevent the event from ever occurring through mitigation efforts, through uh, education efforts, through prevention mechanisms to reduce the threat. We protect our communities by helping them with funding, helping them with ideas, helping them with coordinating resources to lower the risk. We mitigate it by making our community safer by items such as working on a housing mitigation plan to see what the big issues are in order to fix those and resolve those in our future. We respond to the incident, but not in the field response in the emergency operations center response. So when a local government needs assistance, they call us. If you look at 911, get you firefighters, get you law enforcement officers from your local government. When your local government needs help, their 911 is the state division emergency management. They get them the resources to keep a lot of what they need. And then we will look at recovery of how do we get businesses back, how do we get communities back in a resilient state that's better than what it was before the disaster occurred. We work on disasters and emergencies being locally executed, state directed, and federally supported. We have tons of partners in this event. Uh, DEM is mentioned in a lot of different NRS sections. Uh, 414 is our main section, but we are in a lot of other sections of NRS because of our uh, ability to assist in different ways with our resources that we do have. And I'm going to turn this now over to Justin. Luna, our uh, ASO, to talk about the budget highlights. Thank you, Dave. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Justin Luna, for the record, Administrative Services Officer for the division. As Chief Ferguson mentioned, I'll present a brief overview of the next few budget slides, and I'll just focus on the highlights and exceptions since our base budget is largely the same from previous biennials. The division is funded primarily through federal grants which we use to implement national level priorities for reducing risk and increasing resiliency here in Nevada. We have 40 full-time state positions, four positions in budget account 3675, which is the Office of Homeland Security budget, 30 positions in budget account 3673, which is the uh, Division of Emergency Managed budget, budget that we're hearing today, and six new positions in Enhancement Decision Unit E373, which is in this budget account 3673. I wanted to highlight these six positions. Uh, they're new and they're 100% federally funded and have already been approved at the August 2020 IFC for the current state fiscal year. These positions were requested to help manage the disaster grants over the next three to five years. We currently have three of the six positions filled. Two others have contingent offers pending background checks, and the final position is still in the recruitment process. The other two enhancement decision units in budget account 3673 are E710 and E711, and these are for regular equipment replacement and for one vehicle replacement. The total amount of open grants Managed by the division has doubled over the past two years, primarily due to the disaster grants, which can take many years to completely close out. The division structure is or organized into five sections, preparedness section, grants recovery and mitigation, finance and administration, interoperability, which is our statewide communications, and the Office of Homeland Security is integrated seamlessly into the division's operations. And the proposed transfer to the Division of the Military Department, which Chief Ferguson will talk more about later, the recommendation is that the current structure as it exists will simply move intact from one department to the other. Under the transfer of the division chief, uh, Chief Ferguson, that position will report directly to the Adjutant General who serves as the director of the military department. We manage three executive budget accounts, two operating budget accounts are managed seamlessly across the entire division. 
And the pass-through budget account 3674 is used to coordinate over the over $200 million in grant funds to our partner sub applicants. And then this slide is just a high level summary of our annual operating funds alongside the grants that we pass through to partner agencies and local and tribal governments throughout the state to build a more resilient Nevada. Now I'll turn it back over to Chief Overson to uh, talk a little bit more about our operations and to wrap up the presentation. Thank you. So again, in the interest of time, I won't go through so many slides, but I do want to highlight a lot of our partnerships, especially when we look at COVID. Uh, Division of Emergency Management is responsible for warehousing, logistics, testing, vaccination, personnel, equipment, coordinating the resources. Uh, just in the, yesterday, we were in Southern Nevada meeting with Clark County Office of Emergency Management, Southern Nevada Health District, uh, the local uh, government partners that are down there, along with Immunize Nevada, to see how we can continue to move along and open our economy back up, get people vaccinated, and move along with all that we need to do to, to do this. And part of that is there's a picture of a warehouse here. We do maintain two warehouses right now in the state. And DEM at the, the start of the disaster didn't know how to spell warehousing. And now we're running a, two warehouses that put us in the league of an Amazon type process to provide personal protective equipment to our, our state local partners and our nonprofits. And that's been kind of a big joy for Division of Emergency Management to see how well they can come up with new ideas and make something happen on the fly. And they responded very well through this COVID disaster to help our communities. Our bigger component is that Emergency Operations Center. And we, I would welcome any uh, legislator that would like to come visit with us to see how we organize and how we operate in a disaster. The coolest part of DEM is that we're small but mighty. As Justin talked about, we only have 40 FTEs. But when we do have a disaster, we bring in people from all the state agencies to sit in the Emergency Operations Center to help us help our communities. Our bigger component outside that disaster response is how to buy down our risk, as Justin talked about. We have a lot of federally grant funded programs that help us help our communities reduce the risk and the hazard that our communities face every day. So that way, when we do have a disaster, it's less of an impact. And we really work on that resilient strategy of how do we make ourselves more resilient to bounce back from anything that happens much better. All right, a bigger part of the discussion I'm going to assume is going to be for the proposal for the transfer from DEM from BPS to the office or to the Department of the Military. Uh, as you are well aware, the governor's executive budget recommends that we move the division and just fix up at all whole from the Department of Public Safety and move us over to the Department of, uh, Department of the Military. And this was really came as a result of the workings during COVID. DPS is the premier law enforcement agency in the state. However, when we do disasters here as a division of emergency management, we work more with our military partners and with the National Guard. And you've seen them at every testing site location. You've seen them at every vaccination site. Our office is actually on the, the military base for the Nevada National Guard. We share our building with their domestic operations uh, section. And so by combining us, it puts us with the people we work with on a regular routine basis and, a link and streamlines some of those asks between the two different department directors. It aligns us to make it a lot easier for everything to work. It gives us that strategic advantage and all hazard whole community approach so we can do what division emergency management does with our partners at the department of office of the military and it aligns uh, the career train crisis leadership and planning between civil and military capabilities for our state it allows us as a force multiplier again dm only has those 40 ftes the guard has the ability to pull up resources as needed and when COVID first got started dm found themselves found ourselves lacking and some long-term planners. National Guard is able to provide us some long-term planners that work side by side with their civilian employees to build those plans to how are we gonna open a warehouse and get that PPE out? How do we purchase PPE? PPE. How are we open testing sites? How are we open vaccination centers? And then when those employees aren't needed anymore, the Guard members can go back to their regular duties. And that has been a blessing that our state has been able to realize through the COVID disaster so we would like to continue that on a full-time basis and move from the Department of Public Safety over to the Department of the Military. As Justin said, we just want to pick up and move as an entire unit. 
and we will go over to the Department of Military. Right now, the division chief is a direct report to the director of the Department of Public Safety. That standing will stay. We will just become a division chief. We'll report to the adjutant general, who's the director of the Department of Military. So there'll be no real change in the organizational structure, no adding layers or anything along those lines that would, would make our process more cumbersome. And one final slide I do got to talk about before I let you ask any questions you may have is that we would not be your emergency managers if we didn't ask you if you were prepared for that next disaster. Do you have a survival plan? Do you have a 72 hour kit? Not only at home, but at work and in your car, especially when we look at the legislators, you guys have uh, relocated to Reno or Carson City from Las Vegas for weeks at a time. Do you have the ability to be self sustained for 72 hours? And we got to remember that our, our risks are earthquakes violent fires, flood, a severe storm, extreme heat, drought, pandemic. I want to make sure that everyone in our community is safe and prepared and ready to, to take care of themselves for when that next disaster strikes. Thank you. Sorry for the abbreviated presentation. Hopefully uh, it answered a lot of your questions and we are free to take any questions you, would, you can provide for us. Thank you. We do have a few questions. I know I have at least two people that do. Um, so let's start with Assemblywoman uh, Miller. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for that presentation and for reminding us all to be prepared for um, any disaster that heads our way. Uh, we saw the run on the stores with the pandemic, so thank you so much for reminding us of that. Uh, my questions pertain to uh, the benefits that the state experienced from the collaboration with the Division of Emergency Management and the Office of Homeland Security. Um, aligned with the Office of Military during the COVID pandemic, and also how the integration of the of the agencies would provide a benefit going forward. Uh, thank you for the question, ma'am. David Bogerson, for the record. The COVID pandemic really did show the benefit of Division Emergency Management and Homeland Security working with the, the, uh, the Department of the Military. We have some outstanding guards members that that have been working working for a year now through the entire COVID pandemic and, and their call out for that assistance. Our office is shared with their domestic operations. And so we've been able to go back to their domestic operations and ask for assistance. And they've been able to come over and help us as we find more needs from our local communities that they come up with. We've been able to go back and ask domestic operations or the adjutant general for the, that assistance in the entire process. And They've been helping with the, whether it's staffing, whether it's the long range planners that the military is very, very good at planning. And one of the things I think people forget is in a disaster, the response is one part of it, but trying to make sure we have the recovery efforts in place to take care of those at risk is the bigger part. And that's what the military does very good is that logistics. Uh, I think World War II, they said that, you know, the army travels on their stomach. And, and while that might sound a little humorous, that really is what the guard really is good about is how do we get these testing supplies to rural Nevada? How do we get those testing supplies from northern Nevada to southern Nevada? That logistics piece, that planning piece, they're phenomenal at. And we've taken great advantage of the partnership for their military planning efforts applied to a domestic operation, along with the, the staffing that they can provide to assist our locals. And so with this transition, I just see that partnership building even more where we utilize them more for the smaller events that before we might not have pulled them into, but these smaller events, now we can have that better reaching power to ask for more assistance to make our community more resilient. Okay. Right. That answers your question. It does, thank you for that. Can you also um, explain how the recommended transfer will improve the agency's administrative and operational uh, performance compared to its current organ organizational structure? under the Department of Public Safety? Absolutely, thank you for the question, ma'am, David Bogerson. I know there won't be a decrease and we're gonna be looking for those refinements of how we make it better as we go on. Operationally, I can guarantee 100% it's gonna be a, a much better fit just because EM normally works with the Nevada National Guard and doesn't really have to interact much with our law enforcement brothers and sisters in the Department of Public Safety. So operation, I know it's gonna be it's a perfect fit. Administratively, I don't see anything that's gonna be any worse 
and it'll be working through the processes to see how we streamline operations to make it better for the future. Okay, thank you. And thank you, uh, Chair Dennis. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Assemblywoman Titus. Thank you, Chair. Um, good to see you again, Chief Ogerson. Um, thank you for all you're doing for the state of Nevada and you continue to do in, in the past and in the future. Um, quick questions. Uh, do other states have the uh, Office of Emergency Management under their military? Thank you for the question, David Bogerson, for the record. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, Nevada Division of Emergency Management started out as the Office of Civil Defense and started under the Nevada Department of the Military uh, way back in the day, and I believe it was 1967 when we first started. And nationally, I know there are at least 13 states that do the Office of the Military or the Department of the Military, depending upon their state uh, title for that agency, and has emergency management within that. Uh, closest ones to us is probably Arizona, is the, a boring state to us, and they use the same model. But I believe that there are 13. Great, thank you. Uh, that, that Office of Civil Defense is a term that we don't hear anymore, so it's great to get the historical background to this. You also mentioned in your presentation about warehouses. We know that um, some of the monies that have been that you got, maybe 138 million dollars of the COVID relief, was perhaps to purchase some uh, and stockpile some supplies. Um, I know that the military also has warehouses. Are you duplicating efforts? Thanks for the question, ma'am. David Fogerson, for the record. Right now, we're not duplicating uh, any efforts between the two of us. We're seamlessly connected between the two for the COVID response to make sure we have the personal protective equipment to provide for the our nonprofit uh, hospitals or local governments and the state government facilities that require that that personal protective equipment. Uh, we do have under the excuse of the of the explanation, not excuse, sorry for the terminology, um, but the military when they were getting more money and they were stockpiling and they have these supplies. It was also for hospitals. So are they two separate piles there or, and it was all about PPEs and supplies and testing. And so do they complement each other or are you indeed duplicating some services? Thank you, ma'am. David Fogerson for the record. No, I think it's just a matter of explanation. They are staffed in our warehouse for us that is being managed out of the emergency operations center. So I think it's just uh, the semantics of, is it their warehouse or our warehouse? I would call it a joint warehouse and it's jointly managed by both of us. Great, thanks for that clarity. And the final question I have is you mentioned that you're already in the military um, under the National Guard somewhere where you're currently located wherever you are sitting today. So there's not, by changing um, under the direction and being under the military, you're not gonna physically have to change any locations? Thank you for the question, David Fullerson, for the record. Absolutely not, we can stay exactly where we are. Great, thank you. And thank you for the questions, Matt, uh, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Any other questions on this budget? All right, we'll go ahead and close that budget. Um, we are out of time, and so we're gonna have to uh, roll the, the, the rest of the budgets. We have the wildlife budgets coming up. We have another six budgets, and so we're gonna do those on a different day, and so we'll have to reschedule that um, because of time constraints. Um, so that way, uh, um, so those of you that are listen, listening, if you're waiting for those budgets, those are um, we're gonna redo those on a different day um, and reschedule that. So I wanna thank everybody um, for the budgets today. I know we had a lot. Um, we still have another six to go in, in, uh, um, in, in this particular um, budget. So we'll catch that. So with that, um, our next item of business is a public comment. Um, so if uh, BPS could set that up for us. Thank you, Chair. One moment. As a reminder, we are currently on public comment. If you would like to provide public comment and have already joined the call, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 681. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hi, my name is Darlene Anderson 
B A R L E N E Anderson, A N D E R S O N, a resident in Clark County and formerly from the state of California. I'm lo- I was looking for ever for the accountability portion of education being implemented in Clark County. And it's unfortunate that it's affecting so many. The lack of follow through for the federal implementation of the dollars that actually come here to help kids in poverty. And I'm very frustrated and it's not happening. And I think it's the requirements of the Senate and the assembly to ensure that accountability happens for federal dollars for public education in in Nevada. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The public line is open and working and there are no additional callers at this time. Would you like to take a two minute break to allow others watching online time to call in? Um, let's just a little, yeah, let's take a break. Just a, if we could do like a probably a 30 second break, I think that will have been enough time. No problem, Chair. Thank you so much. Broadcast standing by. With the last three digits, 602, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, uh, members of uh, Ways and Means and Finance. Uh, this is Eddie Abelister, E-D-D-I-E-A-B-L-E-S-E-R, with the Nevada Police Union. We want to thank the um, Department of Public Safety for the presentations this uh, morning on the budget hearing. Uh, we do want to advocate on behalf of the 900 members that are um, active with the Nevada Police Union that the recommended budget should include significant attention to either pay or benefit for our members. Currently, um, officers within the Department of Public Safety are paid 30 to 40 percent less than any neighboring jurisdiction. Uh, at the county or city level, and we are struggling with retention issues. We're training officers and sending them straight to a city or county law enforcement agency and spending a lot of money per officer each year. Uh, we believe some of these budget items could be um, postponed. For example, the new vehicle purchase, if the departments would change policy and reflect other states like California, which uh, use vehicles and repair them until uh, the repairs are significantly more expensive than replacement. Uh, there would be a significant cost savings that could be moved into the field of, of pay or benefits to support our officers in the upcoming uh, biennium. So we, refl- we asked this committee to uh, request perhaps amendments to this um, budget item and include uh, significant support for our officers or men and women who are significantly underpaid and have less benefits than neighboring jurisdictions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chair. The public line is open and working and there are no additional callers at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, So with that, um, uh, we'll go ahead and close public comment and uh, um, uh, we want to thank everybody today. I know we had a lot to do and we appreciate it. There was a lot of um, information we needed to get, but uh, um, thank you and thank you to our staff for putting it together. And, and um, with that, we have no further items to come before us at this time. So uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>